afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on researching new overseas markets with BB Financial Services. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at Open Tech Sport. We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step by step articles and guides, regular webinars, our export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find out about all of these on our website at www.opentoexport. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for traders, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. We've got two great speakers today in Craig De and Yvonne Vidal Anderson from Bibi, who I will allow to introduce themselves in more detail now. So over to you, Craig. Yes, good uh, Good afternoon. My, my name's Craig Donnell. I'm the uh, Managing Director for Bibi Financial Services. Um, and uh, we've got Yvonne, who uh, will be speaking later, who's the Head of Operations for Bibi Financial Services. So uh, without, without further ado, Will, I will uh, be happy to, to talk about what we're going to go through to, today. So if we look at the first slide, we'll briefly talk about who we are in Bibi and what we actually do. We'll also share with you some of our research that we've been doing with SMEs across the world, which um, hopefully will help shape some of the decisions you make about going into new markets. We'll also look at research for going into new markets or, or existing markets. What do you plan for? How do you become successful? Uh, and we've got a checklist that we will run through with you. We'll also then look at the, the source of information. So what's actually out there for you? Um, there is lots and lots of stuff out there, but sort of directing you in some of the key things to, to look at. And then finally, we're really happy to answer any questions that uh, you, you may have at the end. So if I start with who, who we are in, in Bibi, um, we are the leading independent financial services partner in the, in the UK. We've um, got a portfolio of products that we support our clients with, which are invoice finance, trade and export finance, construction, recruitment finance, we, we're, we're asset lenders. We also provide bad debt protection and, and really importantly as well, we offer foreign exchange services to our um, international clients, um, but actually all of our clients. We're a family run business and we've, we've been around for around 200 years. So, you know, still very much the, the core of what we do is a family run business in I think that really helps us to empathize with, with local businesses. We lend in over 300 sectors. So there's, there's no sector we actually um, don't look at. We would look at all sectors. We've got clients all over the world. We've got employees over the world. And we're, we're, we're based in Europe, North America, and Asia. We, we look at UK businesses, and we fund their debtors in over 120 countries. And I said before, that the sort of businesses we deal with, we range from startups to, you know, restructured businesses to large multinational businesses. So we look at all types of types of business. I just wanted to touch on the next slide very, very briefly, what, what invoice finance is and in, in what it actually does if you haven't come across it before. So invoice finance, what we do is we look at UK businesses that have got debtors overseas and we help finance those. So you would raise uh, an invoice, we would have a copy of that invoice and within 24 hours we could pay up to 100% value of that invoice. So what that means is obviously you wouldn't have to wait sometimes 30, 60 and in trading internationally sometimes 90 days to get your money. So you can get your money within 24 hours which will probably help you pay staff or suppliers or, or take on new orders. We then collect the payments for you, um, or you can do that yourself if you've got the systems to, to do that. And when the remaining balances come in, we give those back to you plus, uh, sorry, minus any of our actual fees. 
And that very, very briefly in a nutshell is what invoice finance does. And that's what we provide to, to our clients. So what I wanted to get into now on the next slide is, is some of our research. Um, I did want to say, I suppose, at this point that we, we believe that international trade in, in Bibi is fundamentally a really good thing for, for SMEs looking to grow and thrive. But I think our research does suggest that the proportion of SMEs trading overseas does remain pretty modest. It's estimated that fewer than one in five actually export or, or import. And this is despite, I suppose, lots of public in, in private sector um, discussions around the benefits. So what we really wanted to do is explore why, why people don't take the plunge. Um, and although there's probably no single answer to that question, I think one of the things was around emerging, sorry, new markets and where to start with new markets so hopefully some of today will will give you give you that i also i suppose want to dispel a myth that it's not just for big businesses exporting you know it is for all all sizes of business and we we're supporting in, in trying to lobby the government to make that message really really clear so our Global Business Monitor report, which provides us a, a sort of insight into the opportunities and challenges across Asia, Europe, and North America. So this is where the research was uh, take, taken from. And I suppose the first point I, I, I wanted to, to pick up on, on this one is, is just if we look at the, I suppose, key, key headlines, um, Germany... If, if you're looking to, um, to uh, export to Germany, uh, forgive me, um, is, is really confident about their local economy. And I suppose those things are quite important is a headline rate, because if you're looking to export to Germany, you know within that country there's lots of optimism about you know, the strength of their economy. On, on the downside, if we look at SMEs in Hong Kong and the UK, then their sort of optimism about future performance about the economy is, is a lot lower. Um, UK may be explained around Brexit, um, but again, those are some of the things that, that came out. I think in terms of the business sentiment, we've seen that Canada were really, really optimistic about the, the future sales increase. So again, if, if you were looking at Canada as a market, the optimism in that country about sales is, is really, really high and, and really, really buoyant. The challenges actually that, that come out in, in maybe to think about is across the world is, is a lack of um, skilled staff. What we've seen recently, we've seen a number of recruitment agencies that have been really successful um, expanding overseas to, to actually plug that gap of, of unskilled staff. Um, We've also seen as well that in terms of imports across the world, so to help our exporters, it's around 30% of, of their, their business is imported. And, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in terms of what those countries are later. But again, 30% across the countries we looked at are, are welcoming imports into their, into their country, which is, again, really, really positive from, from that perspective. Just looking at payment practices, again, what we've looked at is across the world, pay uh, bad, bad debts are, are increasing, uh, which is something to, to, to really look at. And more and more businesses across the world are, are writing off you know, bad, bad debts. And then finally as well, access to, to cash is, is an important one. And maybe to look at in, in, that, in the countries you're thinking of exporting to, you know, is there cash available for businesses in that country to actually expand and, and utilize you know, the export services that are on offer. So that, that's just, I suppose, a little bit of high level um, research. I want to go now into a little bit more detail and forgive me because the slide, unless you've got great eyesight, you might not be able to see. So we can, we can send this out to you um, if, if you wish um, later on. But if I take the, the sort of top the top uh, left box, which is SME's perception of the, the domestic economy. What, um, what that tells us is in Germany, in Holland, they're, they're the most confident about their respective economies, with Hong Kong and France the least likely 
to, to be positive about their, their sort of picture closer closer to home. So again, if you just look at that, if you were looking to you know be exporting into France or, or Hong Kong, that gives you a view of what their feeling is within their own economy and, and their countries. SMEs in the Netherlands, in France, were, were definitely the most likely to believe that their economies will improve, though. So again, that, that little bit of research there might give you an indication. And there's, there's a number of countries in there which basically tells you whether they think that their perception is good or, or bad about their economy. So again, if you were thinking of any of those countries, you could see that. The next graph below is, is the same countries based upon their, their sort of sales expectation. Uh, and we compiled this, this sort of report by equally weighting SME sentiment on sales performance over the past 12 months, as well as their expect expectations over the coming 12 months. And I think, again, what it showed is Germany and Holland and actually Ireland were really, really confident about the sales growth within their, their countries. Again, Hong Kong and Singapore were the least confident in relation to historic and their anticipated sales performance. And as I mentioned earlier, Canada, again, a country that is very, very confident about sales over the next 12 months with a lot of buoyancy. So, again, if you were looking at those countries and, and you wanted to get a feeling of, of what their perception is around sales increases within their businesses, it might give you a starting point into what countries to, to look at. The other part of this research was average payment terms, which again is, is a vital thing to research, which Yvonne will, will touch on later. But I think what is clear is that late payment um, is a universal problem actually across businesses all, all over the world. So it's not, it's not just in the UK, it's something to be aware of you know, all over the world. On average, SMEs wait around 34 days for payments from, from customers. Um, but there is a lot of differences in, in I think, cultural nuances do, do play a part. So whilst the USA, for argument's sake, they wait just 23.5 days on average, their counterparts in sort of France and Singapore wait almost twice as long as that, which is 45 days. There will be some countries you know, which are even longer than 45 days to pay. And then when you start looking at emerging markets, that's pushed out even further. But again, as I said, Yvonne will touch on that, but a really important bit of research, if you're looking at those countries, um, which, which ones take longer to, to pay might um, be part of your, your research. The other thing here, just on the international trading breakdown, what that actually gives you there is, the, the countries in, in the amount of imports into their country. So for exporters, again, it gives you a steer in terms of which, um, which countries are probably more open to um, importing uh, goods and services. So Hong Kong in, in Singapore, probably not unsurprisingly, they're, they're most likely to take part in international trade. Holland, Ireland and Canada also have really high um, sort of levels of imports. So again, from an exporter's perspective, that, that might be a place to, to, to look at. Businesses in the US, I think that stands out for me, are definitely um, least likely to uh, have um, you know, imports into their country and they're very, very domestically focused as, as you probably would expect um, from, from the US. Uh, and the other thing I suppose I just wanted to, to, to reference is, is the bad debts. And when, when we look at our research around bad debts, you know, very much on the rise, we, we looked at 41% of all the SMEs across the world we, we looked at had suffered a bad debt in the past with, with the Czech Republic actually the, the most likely to, to struggle, you know, with, with rising bad debts. So again, if you were looking at it, exporting into the Czech Republic, that might be something to, to, to really investigate. The, um, the other final bit just, um, just on this uh, slide here was just what are some of the barriers uh, to, to international trade? So speaking to, to these businesses all over the world, what were some of the things that, that concerned them? And I, and I suppose 
some of it, you know, UK exporters can control and some of it they, they clearly can't. But if you looked at logistics, that was something which they were concerned about. So, again, when you're looking to export into new markets, that is something to, you know, make sure you get right and you deliver things when they say they're going to be delivered. The um, the, the bits around language barriers are, are quite quite important making sure you can you know have the team around you to to have those conversations in those different countries cash flow uh, again i know it's probably you can't have a lot of impact on on that for for them but i think in terms of making sure you get the goods to them as soon as possible then they can obviously pay you as soon as possible and make sure payment terms are are positive um, from your perspective um, a, a, a really important is as well. And, and, and the final thing is just those cultural nuances. So again, thinking about you, your research, how do you build those relationships where they're in different countries? Again, Yvonne will give some tips on that, but there's, there's lots of ways of building really, really strong relationships. So I suppose as you see, if you're dealing with businesses in the UK, it's, it's easier to build a good relationship. But that's not to say when you're trading overseas, you can't do that using different mediums and different channels. The, the, the next slide I, um, I wanted to, to, to go on to was a little bit more further research in terms of the, the top destinations to, to export to. The, the bit we do look at, though, which is you know, exporting is, is great. There's a website with regards to that. But 85% of, of the businesses on there actually said that exporting had led to really high levels of growth that they wouldn't, they wouldn't have seen before. So although the previous slide maybe talks about, you know, some of the challenges and some of the things to think about, you know, the businesses that do export do see increased profits as is, is, is well as I think higher levels of, of engagement and positivity as well from, from what we've looked at. So um, I think when we look at export destinations, I think sometimes it's tempting to just look at markets which are close to home and where maybe English is spoken, um, but really, really imprudent that SMEs do actually spend time researching the demand for products and services, relevant laws and customs before deciding on the export destination. But as I said, these are the top 30 destinations that we've, um, we've uh, come to with the, the research that we've undertaken. So I think as you can see, the USA represents the most important export market. Um, probably likely to, to do with minimal language barriers, in, and actually there's relatively low regulatory environment within the US, although that may well change um, with, with change of leadership. I think that the US is also the largest economy in the world um, and, and does have a, a big attraction, I think, for UK exporters leveraging the, the Made in Britain stamp. So although the US you know, does actually, in terms of value, have quite low levels of, of, of um, imports into the country, is still a top destination for, for UK exporters to, to go to. It's quickly followed by the, the likes of Germany, France and Ireland, all within the EU trading bloc. And in fact, what the, the findings have shown is that 50% of the top 20 export destinations are currently within the, the EU. So I think it, it is really, really important to, to recognize the impact of being part of a trade bloc has on, on the EU. Um, and that is why obviously Brexit and, and getting those, those issues resolved to give businesses certainty as soon as possible is really important. And, and we're working with a lot of governing bodies to, to help support that. Um, and also not forgetting that SMEs do really have a, a voice in, in, you've got a voice in, in this as well. Um, I suppose it, as well, what, what we're seeing in terms of the sort of export destinations is what's actually going to these destinations. So um, I think it's an increasingly a, a, a digital age. So compared with current exporters, um, 
I suppose new new small businesses doing this for the first time are also attracted to less familiar destinations. Um, so those less familiar destinations are what we would call is the emerging markets, which are, are highlighted there in, in, in red. And I suppose those emerging markets, you know, China, India, they all feature in the top 10 overall export destinations, along with UAE, which is becoming more and more popular, Brazil, Nigeria, South America, Mexico, they're all appearing in, in the top 30. So... You know, it's not just limited to the the European countries. This is expanding, and we've definitely seen that on a on a month by month basis. Is that some of these markets that people weren't expanding to previously are, are um, now being being thought of. Also, in terms of actually what's being exported, services are, are now account for pretty much, or they will do account for over half of the UK exports from 2026 which is up 44 percent actually on 2016 which will actually put the uk in contention as the world's leader for service exports so that's a change that we've um we've noticed uh of of uh late if i can finally i suppose leave you before i hand over to to avon is what what are people actually exporting what what have we seen into these top sort of export destinations We've seen um, the likes of machinery, vehicles, mineral fuels in, in oil, gems, precious metals, pharmaceuticals. They, those are really the top exports that we, we see. Um, the fastest emerging sort of growing product areas being, being exported are, are things like watches in clocks, um, art in antiques, footwear, um, artificial flowers, you know, more and more clothing actually, but also, as I said, services as well is very much on the increase in terms of what people have now started to to export. So, hopefully, that that gives you a little bit of a feel of our, our research. You know, looking at some of the countries we've researched might give you a feel of you know a starting point is to. Is that country one that you want to deal with? Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Yvonne, who's going to talk about things to look out for and things to check before you start to export and before you go into new markets. Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks, Craig. Uh, well, looking down the list, it looks like quite, quite a long list, but uh, Craig has covered a lot of these all, already. Um, first of all, you need to think about your market and uh, your strategy. And those two things almost go hand in hand. If you're going to sell directly via a sales team, you have to think about the cost involved. Are you going to send salespeople over to a particular market? You have to think about the costs involved in doing that, travel, hotel accommodation, and how they actually reach um, the potential customer base. So therefore, perhaps maybe an intermediate is a good way to go. An agent, a distributor, um, maybe you go to a trade fair with an agent, with a distributor. Uh, they know the market, they're based locally, and can give you support and assistance in, um, in choosing that market. Hierarchical, a subsidiary company, Probably not uh, what you would have established if you're new to exporting, but something to think about as your product becomes successful in specific markets. So really important to have that strategy in place because that will determine a lot at the front end in terms of funds that you have to use to get into a particular market. Craig mentioned markets like uh, Germany, Ireland and the USA. Uh, it's useful to start close to home. If you're looking at an environment such as Ireland, where their legal uh, structure is fairly similar to ours, you may find that that has advantages. Yet at the same time, it may well be that your product doesn't have the market that you might be looking for in Ireland or the EU. You may have to go further afield. So don't feel restricted about 
trading closer to home to begin with. But if you can, then that's certainly probably the better strategy. The legal environment is also really important. Whether you would be trading under a UK legal jurisdiction or maybe your customers say you need to trade under their terms and conditions and contracts. Um, so really important to think about what that means uh, in terms of if there was a dispute, for example, if the legal jurisdiction is outside of the UK, then any disputes would be resolved in the market of your customer. So if you have a dispute in Dubai, for example, you have to think about the costs of staying in Dubai, having an authorized translator recognized by the court, uh, a local lawyer, uh, somebody that really is good at uh, translating all the documentation for you that may be presented to you and how long you're going to have to stay in that market. So these things are really important. Um, quite often when you receive a contract, it's not in the English language, it's in an overseas language. Please don't sign it and then put it away in a drawer. Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of businesses that do that. And the first time we asked to look at the documentation that supports the sale, we talk to them about the fact that the contract is in an overseas language and they'll say, well, we've never had a problem up until now. Please believe me, it's really important to get contracts and terms and conditions translated into English so you know exactly what you're going into when you in enter into an agreement with an overseas customer. Uh, financially stable, uh, we talked about bad debt, or well, Craig talked about having bad debt protection. Uh, really important that uh, you know that your customer is in a position to pay you when the invoice is mature. Uh, you can have trade credit insurance out in the marketplace from uh, well-known trade credit underwriters. There are EULA, Atradius, COFAS, QPE and others. You can go direct, you can go via, via a broker. But uh, we encourage our clients and the exporters that we talk to more and more in, in today's environment, uh, global economic environment, to seek some kind of support, bad debt protection, or as, we, as you would call it, trade credit underwriting. The other advantage that, that trade credit insurance gives, it also gives political and economic risk, as well as protracted default. And in certain markets, particularly the emerging markets, it's particularly advisable to have that additional cover. Contracts and legal jurisdictions, I mentioned those under, under legal environment. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, local customs and procedures uh, under legal environment will have an effect perhaps on, on your product, which might need adapting to meet local need. So if it's a product that you have, yeah, that's something you need to think about. Um, pricing, uh, it's often the fact that you can get more for a product overseas than you can for your own home domestic market. But do make sure that when you're pricing a product for overseas, you take into consideration all the things that we're talking about here. So if you have to get um, contracts translated, if you have to adapt products for the cost of paying commission, perhaps to an agent or a distributor, to sending sales representatives overseas, all these things, all these costs have to be considered when you're pricing your product or your service. Um, think about competitive advantage and barriers to entry. Uh, you know, is there, is there a USP on your product that you can sell when going into a market that you believe from your research will give you a competitive advantage over local suppliers or other international suppliers uh, and language capability you know that's the next one on the list uh, we as as, as English um, admittedly we know we don't have the language capabilities of some of our um, overseas trading partners most companies will speak English but it may well be that you need a good translation agent that can 
translate legal documents for you that can help you with letters perhaps that you might need translating. You know, it's an old adage that usually at the front end, when you're making the sale, your customers speak English. Although sometimes when you come to the collection process, they don't speak English. So something for consideration there and, and brings us um, quite nicely onto collection processes. How are you going to collect those invoices overseas? Are you going to send emails out? Are you going to make telephone calls? Um, all these things you have to think about. And if it is phone calls, then maybe you do need some kind of language um, capability. Maybe this can be provided by your funder. Uh, terms of payment. Uh, we were looking at uh, on the previous slide how long it takes various markets to pay. Um, the longer the term of payment, ideally, uh, as sooner after that you would expect to receive payment. I always like to think that if we draw an imaginary line across the Loire Valley somewhere in France, anywhere above, above that, terms of 30 days or 30 days end of month are quite usual. But if you go south of there, even in EU markets such as Spain, Portugal, Italy, they will traditionally be expecting a longer term of payment. In the same way that if you're exporting, for example, to the USA or to Southeast Asia, it takes longer to ship the goods, particularly if they're going by sea. When the goods arrive, you want the customer to have the same term of payment that he might uh, receive locally. You know, we were talking about competitive advantage previously. You want to make sure that if locally the average term of payment is 45 days from invoice date, that once the, the goods arrive, with your customer that you're giving them a, a fairly equal time to pay. Now that could mean that overall the terms of payment stretch to 60, 75 or 90 days. So my thought there would be, or my message to you, that if you've given 90 days from date of invoice or 90 days end of month, that when that term matures, that you expect to be paid very promptly. So. Um, and I think this, this pans out when you look at the USA, who are very good at, at paying um, after maturity compared to some other of the markets. So really important to think about terms of payment and indeed what effect that will have on your cash flow. Now, when you're entering into exporting for the first time, transport and inco terms are going to perhaps be something you've not given so much consideration to previously. Inco Terms 2010 um, will provide you with full details of the different methods of shipment that you can have with your customer, uh, where risk transfers and who is responsible for what in that shipment process. If you take the term FCA named place, that's probably the shortest payment term, or sorry, the shortest Inco term where risk transfers to the customer. And at the far end, you've got DDP, which means the exporter is invariably paying for the goods to be trans, uh, transferred directly to your overseas customer to their warehouse. Um, again, depending on, on the INCO term, may have a reflection on the terms of payment and when your customer believes he will be paying. So take care because sometimes overseas customers think that their terms of payment don't start until the INCO term risk transfers to them. Marketing, also very important. How are you going to do that? Again, is it going to be directly? Is it going to be through the agent or the distributor? You know, if you're going to a trade fair, uh, you'll need brochures. You might need to adapt your, your website to suit the overseas market. Maybe you have elements of your trip, your website transfer, uh, translated into another language, perhaps the key languages such as German, French, maybe Spanish or Italian. And again, those things are costs that you need to think about when you're pricing your product or your service. Uh, in terms of whether the product is legally exportable, uh, I mentioned briefly previously, you may have a product that sells well in the UK, but perhaps, for example, if you're exporting it to Japan, 
there may be some local commercial requirements that suggest you need to adapt that product, that you need to put it in different packaging, that you need to make sure that the marketing, the market you're exporting to um, requires you to have a label on the packaging in that local language. If there are um, instructions that go with the product, again, they will have to be translated into the language of the markets that you're exporting to. Currencies and foreign exchange. Now, uh, previously, Craig mentioned that uh, concerns over uh, currency losses are one of the biggest concerns that uh, our clients and the exporters that we speak to tell us is their biggest concern. Uh, again, to compete locally and have that local advantage, you are probably going to have to invoice in a currency other than sterling. That may be euros and outside of Europe, most likely US dollars. So think about the currency that you're going to be invoicing in. Think about whether you might need forward exchange contracts. There are some good foreign exchange companies out in the marketplace that will service you, maybe sometimes a little bit more cheaply than your bank might. Bibi Financial Services, for example, they have a, an FX business, which we run alongside our invoice finance facility. Um, and we find that, that, that our clients think that that's a, that's a great advantage. If you don't take um, foreign exchange contracts, if you're only trading in spot, then it may well be if the currency moves in the wrong direction, all of a sudden you're down four or five thousand pounds. You're getting money, you're getting less in than you expected when you convert back to sterling. And those exchange losses, of course, come straight off the boss, bottom line and are far from welcome. Export credit insurance, I mentioned that previously as well, really important, helps you sleep at night. Um, political and economic risk cover for those what we might call higher risk markets outside of the EU, non-OECD markets. Your cash flow and your cash flow projections will be affected by going into exporting because if you're offering longer terms of payment, your money is turning more slowly, coming back in more slowly than anticipated for the domestic market, uh, it will have an effect on your cash flow. Time zones and language barriers uh, go hand in hand in as much as when you're collecting the invoices, particularly if you have a slow payer, you may find it difficult to converse with the people that you want to talk to about payment of your overseas um, invoices. And added to that, you have the problem of time zones. If you're wishing to collect a debt in Southeast Asia, they're going home to bed just as you get up to go to work. So you have to um, think about how you're going to mitigate the risks of time zones and language barriers, again, when you're choosing the markets that you're first entering into. Start small and test. So once you've picked a market, once you've found an environment that you think would be suitable for your product and your service, then start maybe with one or two customers. Um, you know, I, I, I can see, we know from our own clients that there is um, an idea that particularly if you have an agent or a distributor, that they will tell you they can bring on so many customers in a very short period of time. Start slowly, dip your toe in the water, uh, think about all the things that I've talked about here to see whether actually your product does fit the market that you think that you're going into. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And having talked about uh, all those things, the checklist, the things that, to consider, uh, there is help out there, and certainly you're not alone. Uh, if we look at your funder, you know, Craig has explained to you what Bibi Financial Services provide, but of course that we recognize that there are other providers out in the marketplace that will give you similar support. So it's well worth speaking to your funder to find out exactly what they do offer if you're looking to go into an export uh, environment. Look at country profiles. You only have to go onto the internet. Most of the trade credit insurers in the UK provide country profiles um, and payment information on certain markets. So if you've picked a market, 
a really good idea to see what you can find out about that market on the internet uh, in terms of whether they're slow payers, good payers, what the legal environment looks like. Uh, you can get risk rep reports from uh, a range of um, uh, websites and international search engines. Uh, there's um, Dun Bradstreet as well, for example, and Credit Safe. There are so many in the marketplace that will give you risk reports both at market and customer level. Uh, open to export action planning. Um, obviously, we couldn't continue without mentioning this. It's a great tool. And we recommend the export action planning tool to all of our clients, whether they're existing exporters or new to export. Is that something that, uh, Will, you wanted to talk about in greater detail at this point, or should we cover it off at the end? Yeah, I can talk briefly about it. So yeah, the, um, thank you, Yvonne. The Open to Export Action Plan tool, it allows you to answer questions along each step of the export journey. So whether that's from very kind of initial steps, like it getting started, you're doing a SWOT analysis to see where your strengths and weaknesses may lie through to the, the nitty gritty of getting it delivered and the documentation you may need to do so. Um, and at the end, it creates a um, coherent plan of action with actions you need to take to make sure that you are fully ready um, to, to get going with the next steps and export. Um, and yeah, I'll show, I can talk a little bit more about that at the end as well in terms of where you can find out more information about it, but it's a really good tool for people who are just figuring out what they need to do to take the next steps and export. Back to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much. Uh, we work with a range of external organizations. Uh, the DTI, uh, they run trade missions to certain markets, uh, perhaps particularly those markets further afield. So if you are looking, for example, to South America or Southeast Asia, do check out the, um, the uh, DIT and find out what trade missions they have coming up. They can support you. Uh, the ICC, very importantly for us, the Institute of Export, they run education programs for exporters um, and uh, courses. We have our own staff that take the IOE courses um, and it's a great, uh, great sort of stepping stone into how to export efficiently. Trade shows, uh, we've touched on, go to trade shows um, if you think that that could be relevant for your, your product. Um, but again, think about the cost. As I mentioned, trade missions, events, even if you're not showing at events and trade shows, interesting maybe to go to yeah, let's say, for example, a trade show in Germany, have a look at the local competition, see how companies are doing things out there and maybe get a, a good feel uh, by networking um, to local companies as to how you think your product or service might fit into that market. Um, look for case studies, talk to established exporters. And if you're working with uh, the ICC, uh, DTI, uh, British Exporters Association, as I said, the Institute of Export, um, they will have exporters who ideally may already be exporting a product in a similar industry to your own or, or services. Find out if you can speak to exporters um, and get a feel for how they've, be, they've been successful and see if you can learn anything from, yeah, from their mistakes, ideally, as well as their successes. And on to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand back to you, Craig, to finish off. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. As I said, there was a lot of, lot of data, a lot of information covered. So hopefully you, uh, you picked up one or two things from, from that. Just, um, I suppose, needless to say, um, you know, both Yvonne and I have... Um, you know, been in been in the sort of finance industry in in Avon, working all over the world uh, for for many years, and and we're really passionate about supporting exporters. So, if um, if anybody's got any questions, then um, please please ask. Um, and if after if anybody's got any questions or they want any more information, then please feel free to 
to contact myself and Yvonne on the, the telephone numbers there on the screen. But uh, thank you for listening and thank you for your time. And back to you, Will. Many thanks, many thanks, Craig and Yvonne. Some really, um, some great research you've you've done there, and I hope everyone's found that useful. So, a really thorough introduction to the key kind of areas to to research and look into as as an exporter. And indeed, um, just one thing I'd like to add on the resources in terms of the country profiles. The Institute of Export does really good doing business guides for different markets. If you're looking at uh, any particular country, do have a look on the uh, Institute site because um, there's a whole list of other guides that they've done previously. Um, so yeah, uh, as Craig mentioned, we're now going to open the floor for a few questions. So please do ask questions using the control panel on the right hand side of the screen as indicated on the slide now. Um, the first question I'm going to put to Craig, it comes from Kevin. He's just asking about the research actually. So he's asking, are, is, is the data and graphs based solely on SMEs and his, he's got a second question which is what are the top B2B products and services being exported from the UK? Greg. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, so um, information was, um, or the research was was on on SMEs, so uh, that that was the, the first part of the question. I suppose the second bit was was it around what what the sort of top exports are? What are people actually exporting? Yes, yeah, so what are the top exports of um, services and products in particular from the UK? Yeah, I mean the the, the top ones are, are machinery, vehicles come out quite quite high. Computers, that's um, that's something we see a lot of. Um, mineral fuels, oil. Um, Sort of gems, think, in precious in metals. In particular for services and um, B2B rather than goods, I suppose. Oh, rather than goods. Um, what do we see? I, I suppose the, the recruitment services tend to, um, so if I look, look at that more recently, recruitment services in, in selling their sort of services of placing people of, of Sort of taken off quite quite considerably of, of late um, consultancy um, uh, again of consultancy of all types of things if there's a you know a really good consultancy really good brand we've seen more and more of those sorts of things work in in take off um, recently um, Yvonne have you got anything else on the services from I, I would say that we're seeing a lot of businesses, uh, technical manpower, particularly in the oil and gas industry, as oil and gas in uh, Scotland has declined, we've seen uh, more businesses going out to uh, North and West Africa, again to Southeast Asia and to South America, um, Argentina springs to mind in particular. So we are seeing a lot of uh, oil and gas manpower services. We have some great technical skills um, that, that haven't been put to use in recent years with the decline in the oil and gas industry in Scotland. And now uh, our clients and those, those businesses are finding uh, new avenues to go to in those markets. Hey, interesting. Cool. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and a question we've had in from Eduardo, and he's asked about um, kind of what you anticipate happening in terms of UK exports to Latin American markets, both in the short and the long term. So I'm wondering what findings you've had in terms of Latin America. Um, uh, yeah, Yvonne. Yeah, I think, again, it just goes back to what I was just mentioning. We don't see so much on, on the uh, manufacturing side going out to South America, but certainly manpower. Um, as I mentioned, Argentina in particular, this has become um, a fairly popular market for our clients, uh, sometimes considered a slightly higher risk market. So uh, we always make sure that there's trade credit insurance involved when we're supporting exporters going out to those markets. Um, but yeah, definitely seeing an increase in, in South America in technical manpower, experienced technical manpower. Thank you. And uh, a question, we've had a couple of questions in around um, how you find out if a product is legally exportable or how do you find out information about required for a specific product in a specific market. 
Um, do you guys have any recommended resources for, for that sort of specific regulatory information? Uh, I, th I think the first port of call there for me would probably be the DIT because they have local offices on the ground in, in most markets around the world, uh, commercial attaches that would be able to help them get the information that they need, perhaps from the, from the government bodies. I mean, to be fair, you can go on the World Wide Web and quite often you'll find a, a tranche of information about certain products and certain legal requirements. But I would suggest that the DIT is a good support in getting the information you, you need in that respect. And would yeah, you... Will, sorry, Will, I, I would say as well, you know, we, um, and I'm, try, I'm trying to remember off the, the top of my head, but we use a lot of um, books when we're looking at, you know, when, when we are funding and people come to us with products in different countries, we, 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 we've got lots and lots of books which we, we fit, flick through in terms of the countries um, with lots of specific information. What I'll do, what I'll do afterwards, Will, I'll, I'll sell you the, uh, tell you the name of those books so you can cascade that, that out if people want to really get into the, the granular detail. Thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, I think something comes to mind, which we often advise, Mark Access Database can be quite useful as well, if um, for, for as long as we remain in the EU anyhow. But um, also Chris, um, one of the attendees has suggested um, kind of accreditation bodies like Intertech and has referred to books like Tates and Crohn's. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, 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 yeah. Well, that's, that, that, that is a good, that's a good reference, undoubtedly. Yeah, that, that's, um, th thank you for that, because I, I was searching in my mind what it was called. But yeah, that, that is a, a, a very, very useful book in, in worthwhile investing, I would suggest. Cool, man. Thanks, um, Chris, for, for writing in on, on that point as well. Yeah, thanks, um, Chris. Another really um, good, uh, sorry, someone just asked what the book titles were again, uh, Tates and Crohn's. Um, yeah. So another question which has come in is, is around obviously the big B word in Brexit and it's particularly around the customs question which is going around at the moment. Um, obviously with 50% of the top nations in the EU um, from, the, from the survey, kind of what can companies do to prepare for the potential impact that um, the Brexit might have, particularly around if um, customs union when we're not in anymore there's no customs arrangement agreed yeah i think yeah, obviously it's a it's a really sort of topical uh, a, a topical question um i think you know when we when we ask our our clients about it um if, if we look at brexit and their views on the the sort of custom union there's i think it's around 40% of them would probably say it's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> um, and there is about 11% who think it's good and, and will generate lots and lots of opportunity for them. But I think un undoubtedly um, it, it, it throws up challenges as well as opportunities. I think, I think regardless of Brexit, I would say that the planning is, is really important. So Yvonne's touched on the research already, but, but planning, you know, making sure as a business you've, you've got a really clear plan, um, making sure you've really got some good quality cash flows and projections in, in those sorts of things, I, I think really help regardless of Brexit. And uh, as I said, Brexit will definitely throw up some opportunities. It's definitely thrown up some, some challenges. But planning around your business, making sure you've got good people around you, making sure you've got cash and funding, I think, uh, are critical. But I think those things, as I said, are regardless of whether, you know, we're um, talking about Brexit or, or not. Many thanks. And I guess the, the only thing I'd add to that is um, investing the skills in, in your team as well. And that's something obviously the, the Institute um, is drumming home is the importance of taking qualifications to get the skills which will help you prepare for when the whatever happens after Brexit, whether it's a change in customs arrangements or or not. Um, so yeah, definitely yeah. have a look on the site for, for info about, about that. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and the other thing I would say, which I sort of touched on earlier, is that, you know, there's 
you know, like, like all of you, you know, guys have attended today, you know, running SMEs, you, you've got a lot of the, the answers and a lot of insight. And um, it's about getting that voice heard. And, and I think, you know, organizations such as sort of open to export, but, but a lot of the, the government sort of uh, agencies out, out there as well, that there is lots of, lots of opportunity, I think, to, to give give your voice and give our voice and i think that definitely needs to happen to help shape what 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 happens you know through through brexit but don't don't feel like you haven't got a voice because I, I would suggest the people on the phone here have got masses amount of insight and knowledge as, as well to, to share which will be hugely beneficial Great, many thanks, Craig. And I think on that note, um, it's probably time for us to wrap up. Uh, thank you once again to Yvonne and Craig for speaking today. And I hope everyone's found that useful. Thank you all. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, just a quick note to say that um, any questions we didn't get around to, we can always take offline. Just a couple of things from the Institute to uh, bring your eyes to. Um, our graduation ceremony in London is later this month and that's coming up fast now. It's a great opportunity to meet some of the future stars of international tra trade and to network of senior figures and decision makers across the industry today, including the Secretary of State for International Trade, Dr. Liam Fox. Go to export.org.uk forward slash events to find sign up details for that. And perhaps next year it could be yourself or someone from your own business graduating with a qualification in international trade. Our qualifications are designed to give individuals and businesses the skills needed to export successfully and compliantly. And um, as just mentioned in the Q&A, there's obviously various reasons why that is important. So please do go to export.org.uk forward slash qualifications for more information about that. Our next webinar sees us cover Japan as a market for the first time. Export to Japan will be giving practical tips and an overview of the challenges of, and opportunities of selling there, while previous Export Action Plan competition winners 436 will talk about their experiences selling into Japan as well. You can find out all about the webinars at opentoexport.com forward slash webinars. And as mentioned earlier, please do have a look on the site for more information about the Export Action Plan tool, as there's a great um, tool for, for um, covering some of the research points which Yvonne and Craig mentioned earlier. As always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. But for now, many thanks and goodbye. <laughs>